you know, to me, I'm always sort of asking questions about where the industry is going and, and what intrigues me the most. Um, you know, I think as industry insiders, um, the biggest challenge we have for ourselves is understanding the world outside us. You know, so it's, it's you know, the, the, I think you guys as a collective group are probably a little wiser than the 26 year old that I met and told me nobody watches TV. But we do inside the industry, and I don't just mean the entertainment industry, I mean this in marketing and advertising too. Uh, we perpetuate a lot of our own myths. So one of the conversations I had uh, recently was actually with a friend of mine at Happy Hour, and we were talking about Twitter. And I was like, you know, everybody's like so into like, we have to do everything on Twitter. I was like, you know, do you realize that like, you know, compared to Facebook, half the population is on Twitter compared to Facebook. It's much lower penetration than Facebook is. Never mind the fact that it can only be short form. Um, I was like, we inside the industry, everybody we know is on Twitter. 100% of our friends are on Twitter, so we think everyone uses it. Fact, like maybe 35, 40% of the population even has an account, and probably half of those actually use it. You know, so <clears throat> Facebook is more like two thirds of the population, and they're using it regularly. It's it's just it's in its own league, relatively speaking. So it's it's interesting to me, and the same thing with Instagram and Pinterest. You know, we think everybody's on it. It's like one in ten people in the United States are on it. In our circle of friends, it's probably over half, because we're all looking at this new, these new technologies and saying, hey, what's the new cool thing? What do we need to do? How do we integrate it? And that's smart. We should be doing that as industry insiders. But there's the consumer side, which is hey, is this actually taken off on a consumer level? Um, you know, and what does this mean? You know, I, I was personally fascinated by the Instagram acquisition um, because I don't think it's worth anywhere near a billion dollars. And so, you know, I, mean, I don't know how you could possibly come to that now, right? Um, and at the time, I sort of took a step back. I'm like, okay, why would Facebook do this? And there were all sorts of people pontificating about that on tech blogs and such. And you know, the, I think the prevailing sentiment in the tech world was, well, they're not doing it for the app, which Facebook probably could have developed in a week and done themselves. Like, that's not something that's particularly fancy. They did it for the users. And I thought, well, but if you look at consumer data, you know, Instagram has maybe 10% market penetration and Facebook has like 65 to 70%, depending on the group you're looking at. So probably they're not getting a whole lot of new people. I would say most of the people on Instagram also have a Facebook account. So they're not really getting new people. So I was like, that's not why they did it. They didn't do it to get new people. Like, I think they did it for imagery. I think they did it because Instagram is a new cool thing and that's part of what Facebook needs to be is always on the edge of innovation. Do I think they overpaid? Absolutely. <laughs> but and do I think they'll get a return on the investment? Absolutely not. I don't think it's possible to get a return on that, that particular investment. But when you take a step back and look at consumer data, it was fascinating to me that all these tech blogs were saying, oh, they did it for the people. They did it to acquire the consumers. And like, th that, they couldn't possibly have done it for that reason. If you uh, have any sense of how, how much Instagram has actually penetrated the population, um, that doesn't make any sense. You know? But these are people who live in Silicon Valley where 100% of their friends probably have the Instagram app on their phone. And they probably skewed to iPhone users instead of Android users, so they were early adopters of it. Um, and that's not necessarily representative of the whole population. There was actually an article that came out, I think in Ad Age, last week or a week or two weeks ago maybe, that it was this great infographic, and it's in the presentation that I'll put up, um, about the marketing and advertising industry and their adoption of different, different media tools, and then the population and their adoption. And it was hilarious, because you see stuff like Twitter is like 92% among the advertising and marketing industry, but it's like 38% in the population. You know, and you start to understand why people think stuff is so, so important, because in the world it's so, so important, but in the rest of the world it's not necessarily important. You know, and I think that's really where the audience perspective becomes really important, uh, because it got, kind of helps us pop that bubble and understand what does the rest of America think? When I take myself outside my peer group, which is representative of nothing, <laughs> right? It's representative of my peer group of fairly, like, you know, career mobile, forward thinking individuals who are probably more highly educated than the, the average person. That's not representative of much except that little world, you know? Uh, when you look at the broader world, it's a very different adoption behavior with very different considerations. Um, and it gives you a different sense of what's going on in the mar marketplace and, and how to address that. And I think when you start to understand that, you know, and, and really look at what's going on in the marketplace and what consumers really believe, and, and, and I think a step beyond that, understand the psychology of it. Um, that's the thing that made me so interested in getting into market research is I think of it as a psychology-based job. Um, I don't think of it as a statistician job, although I do have a degree in statistics. That's not the part that interests me. It's a means to an end, <laughs> you know? The part that interests me is the psychology and sort of seeing the light in people's eyes when you're 
in a focus group or something like that and you see why people are consuming content and you start to understand what's going on behind the scenes, it very rarely boils down to something that's data or technical specific. It tends to boil down to something that like hits them here. you know, And that's something that's really important to remember. Um, and technology can facilitate that, but it doesn't tend to create it. And I think that's the distinction that we see. So I know I was going to try to talk for 15, 20 minutes, which I think I've accomplished. But I would be glad to take questions on sort of what you have. Maybe I was receiving a phone call and distracted the moment you said, but what do you mean when you say digital dimes, di digital dollars? So um, I, I mean that almost very literally. So typically advertising is someone was talking. question for the oh. She was, <laughs> good point, thank you. Um, she was asking what, what I mean by digital dimes versus traditional dollars. Um, the, and it's a phrase that sort of gets taken among advertisers. Say, say it again, I think I didn't hear it right. Are you saying digital dimes and traditional dollars? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that, that helps right there. That is correct. Um, so advertising is typically sold on what's called CPN, cost per million. And on TV, that number is literally five to ten times as high as it will be online. So that's that's what they mean by that. Literally the same exact pre-roll will sell for a much lower price point online than it will on, on a TV show. And actually where that's coming from is um, pre-roll tends to work better in front of long form content. You know, that's the fundamental YouTube challenge, <laughs> right? Is that that's you know video is that we're rooted in this concept of pre-roll, but we need to figure out another form of advertising because Sitting through 30 seconds to watch two minutes, you're not going to do that very many times. Sitting through 30 seconds or two minutes of multiple pre-rolls to get to an hour is a very different process. You know, when, when there's more content to be had as a result of that, people are more willing to sit through it. And that's why Hulu works. You know, Hulu has much better view-through rates than any other site. I mean, they just, they trump the competition by a huge factor because they're long-form con content. Short-form content sites have trouble with that. You know, and, and that's why you see a lot of pre-roll on sites moving to 15 seconds instead of 30 to 60. 